All right, so we are recording. So we're all here today, uh, myself, uh, Marty Knauss, uh, Jonathan, uh, Diane, and Woody. Uh, and uh, we, some of you may know uh, uh, us as uh, my, my screen name is M. Knauss, uh, Jonathan is J. Seifert, uh, Woody is Woody P, and Diane is Zia3. So we are going to go over a quick rundown of above ground pool uh, installations, equipment, maintenance, etc. We have an hour. We're going to spend an hour on this and we're going to move forward. So I'll just uh, go ahead and start the process. Start. Uh, first of all, when you go to select a pool type and size, so uh, one of the things would be what area do you have for your pool? Any comments anybody can have on how they selected their, the size of their above ground pool? Whatever fits the size of your backyard, brother, big as you can go. <laughs> <laughs> this stays out the city property line. Good you point. can get ropes or extension cords or whatever you can make a boundary with and see it and just kind of, you know, measure out how big you can go because you have to know where your easements are, your setbacks and everything. I didn't necessarily check that out. I ended up putting mine up over where all the utility lines run. Um, so that... That may have in, been a problem for somebody. My neighbor behind me set hers up kind of the same way and had to redo her mainline sewer and ended up having to take her pool out. So uh, you want to you want to know where all your utilities and things run before you put it up too. Here, here's a funny story for you about marking all those lines. Uh, like cable people were out here doing theirs or whatever, and uh, I I caught this old boy. I said I said I won't play a big trick on my wife. I said, I'm gonna need a couple of bundles of those yellow flags that you got there. And before she got home, I ran over and stuck them all over the backyard. I said, honey, can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a combination of both of those methods. Uh, we went with the biggest uh, Intex style pool that we could find. And then I also, before we did the purchase, I marked it out with uh, rope and flags and had the utilities marked out as well so I could see where everything would fit. Yeah, and like uh, Kelly's brought up, you want to know where you can hook your pump up to, so you need to know where you can access the electrical and um, things like that, because they discourage you from using extension cords to set up your pump. You really shouldn't do that, and we're not going to tell you it's okay to do that, but we're, we know it. people do it. Great, so the, the next step would be, uh, there's different types of, of above ground pools that people may be confronted with. Some are metal sided, some are, are uh, hard sided, some are soft sided, et cetera. Can you uh, give the folks a rundown of the, the pluses and minuses to the different types? A theory minus. <laughs> this yeah. <laughs> Obviously, this is a, a hard side of the grove, grove ground pool, 16 by 32, and I just replaced a couple of these top rails, for lack of a better word, and this one is is the one that I can still show you that's still holding together, just just saying. <laughs> my, my, my advice to you, if, if, if you're in the mood to do all that good stuff, here's a couple of actual cap plates that I've got that uh, sit on top of the metal post and tie the two rosin bench ledges things together and whatever. Uh, this first one I'm going to show you is, oh, it's shiny new metal, isn't it? It's just like all those shiny new boats they give you and they tell you, oh, they are uh, stainless steel boats. Well, let me tell you something, folks. There's about 14 different grades of stainless steel boats and there's no qualifier. What I suggest you do on these plates, if you got one, is see the difference. I bought a can of a uh, spray galvanizing spit that they call. They use it in on field construction all the time. Spray that rascal down and it will last a lot longer than your bare metal shiny. I ain't gonna make it through next week post. <laughs> yeah, my pool had steel balls and it developed a, a rust issue that in a few years became a fatal rust issue for my pool. So you, if you have a steel wall pool and if you can, before you set it up, you want to 
maybe add an extra layer of rust protected on that inside wall. And just throughout the time you have it up, keep an eye on it. And if you see any rust starting, just jump on it. Don't do what I did and let it wait because it's not going to get any better by itself. We, we went with the uh, Intex style pool, you know, with the vinyl walls and then the metal post to support it. Um, mostly because it's it was a little bit cheaper. Well, or so we thought, but then <laughs> the fence and everything else ended up costing more than the pool did. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a great way to to let us know that, you know, that we did really like a pool. And uh, so I think in the future, I'll go with a hard sided pool and probably I'm leaning towards like a resin pool so that I don't have to deal with the uh, rust issues on a metal wall pool. Great. So let's, let's step uh, next to the installation side of the game. Uh, and I'm assuming that uh, there's probably different installation methods between different types of pools. So kind of address that a little bit, but first and foremost, from what I got from everybody was a leveling. So someone go ahead and uh, give us a rundown on, uh, les on leveling for a, a, an above ground pool. It's called a transit. And if somebody knows how to use one, that's the only way that you're going to get that rascal level. Mine was dug out. My pool is buried two feet deep. So they dug down through everything. And I've got, it looks like a clay bowl is what they put it in. And it's, it's hard packed acidic clay. And the guys get in there with their little and shoot, shoot it off the transit. And that's the way you know that it's level. No way you put the darn thing up and start measuring the height of the walls all the way around. You've lost more at that game. Yeah. You can also use uh, what's called a water level. Works pretty well. It's got a tube connected to two uh, yardsticks, essentially. You fill it with water. You'll see the height on both sides. You can tell what the difference is. Um, when I, they did come with the stick, with a skid steer to level my backyard, I hired that out. Um, they did have a transit though, and that's much faster than water level because I did use a water level to spot check later, but transit is sure faster. Yeah, and when you set your um, paver blocks down for your uprights, you want to find where the lowest spot originally was on your site because that's where everything should be leveled to. You don't want to build up anything. It's not going to hold up. But you find that lowest spot, you set your paver there, you set it flush, and then all the other pavers as you go around, you're going to take that first paver as your reference site and measure you know, like from paver one to paver two and level it, you're not gonna, and then you'll go paver one to paver three and go all around. You don't wanna go one to two, two to three, because, you know, if you're within an inch tolerance of each one, that can really build up by the time you get all the way around the pool. You could end up two or three inches out of level because you were measuring them one off the other instead of from one reference point. Very good point. Now, one comment that was brought up, and most people would say, well, this would be the perfect place to put a pool because it should be really flat and level, is a concrete slab. Why is that not necessarily a good thing to do? They're nearly always sloped. <laughs> pretty much. Um, in fact, uh, for reference, we have a, a spa that came with our house that's sitting on the uh, patio outside of just a concrete slab. And that's only, you know, the hot tub's only five feet across or so, five, six feet, and it's already an inch out of level. So, I mean, if you're talking about a 20 foot pool, you're gonna be three, four inches out of level across the pool. It's because when they build the houses and you've got a, a poured concrete patio and everything else, they're designed to be sloped away from the house. So keep water out of the house or whatever. I, I took, I left my existing uh, concrete small patio there and I did decking all the way around uh, wood and it's like 20 feet long and it's got to, I had to match the slope of the concrete match that bevel <laughs> out till I got to where I could come back up flat <laughs> yeah and it's one thing if you go ahead and have a level pad poured to put your pole on but you're still going to need a lot of padding under that between you and the concrete because that will tear up your liner if you don't and um, the other thing you can do if, if there's difficulty leveling out your yard is you can build a big box 
fill it up with decomposed granite or crushed stone of some sort that will compact down well and make a level pad that way instead of digging. But that's a lot of work and a lot of money. Yeah, well, that would transition to the next spot would be was what to put under the pool, as we just discussed and Diane brought up the fact, you know, if it's put on grass or on dirt, are there certain things that should be put under the pool? Uh, you need a weed barrier. You need to spray down really well with nut grass killer first, no matter where you live, because that stuff will go right up through your liner and tear it up. Um, so at least the nut grass killer, preferably some sort of tarp or gorilla pad or something that'll also help act as a weed barrier. Um, for the steel wall or traditional above ground pools, there's usually a sand base that they level out and form a cove to keep that liner from getting pinched under the wall. For a lot of uh, people that put up the intact style pools will use uh, insulation foam or foam mats under their pool to give it a, a good padding. Yeah. yeah, that that's what I did on our Intex pool as I got, uh, I believe it was inch thick, extruded polystyrene as they, it's usually either pink or blue, depending on which store you get it from. And uh, a little expensive, but it made a really nice floor for the pool. Great, so now, Supporting the legs, obviously a hard-sided pool, you're not supporting the legs because that is an inter integral wall system, I, I'm assuming. But uh, as, as far as an Intex type, you do have to support the legs, is that correct? That is, that is correct. Uh, several people, including me, have tried it without doing that, and that's a mistake. <laughs> uh, I had to quickly correct that. Uh, so that two most common things is either pressure-treated wood or really thick um, concrete pavers. Um, I went with the pressure treated wood. It was, uh, I got two by 12s and cut them into foot long sections. So I had, you know, about a foot square under my legs for the circular pool. Um, I think like a rectangular style Intex pools might need bigger ones. Um, they also have more weight on them. On my metal wall, Boo, it's got, uh, you know, the proper size concrete pavers or whatever there because it's an oval pool it's got like a half of an a-frame that comes out to the sides and it, you know to rest on a base there so on both sides alongside the pool they're all sitting on concrete pavers like that that are two rounded ends that i don't i don't recall that there being anything up under those so and I, I see some discussion about where to put those pavers is it flush with the ground is it above is it below what's can give a little they should be flush and my, my pool was round and I had pavers under every upright. Because <coughs> you don't want it to, it'll still sink, you know, if you don't. Great. Uh, there that. was something else about what you were asking that original question. Now I've forgotten what it was. And on the supporting? Yeah, you definitely want the pavers on any type of pool. Okay. Because I had assumed that with solid wall pools, you probably didn't need papers. So great point. Um, no, because those walls themselves are very thin. They're very flimsy. There's not, they won't support much on their own. In fact, that's a problem with leaving a pool empty. A good stiff wind can blow it over and crease your walls. And then it's, you know, pretty much ruined. Right. What about drainage? Do you, I mean, Woody, I know you've got a semi in ground, so you, you've sunk it. I imagine you had to deal with drainage. What about in general? Is drainage an issue that people need to think about? All oh, my drains right down the sides of the pool to the bottom, is all I can tell you. <laughs> uh. You don't want to put anything up against your metal walls that's going to hold moisture. You don't want to use mulch. You don't want to pile sand against it. You should put gravel or rocks or something that's going to drain well. Because you want, you want to keep that wall and rail area as dry as possible close to the ground so you don't get a rust problem there. I use bricks around mine. I had sand under it and then bricks on top of it. Great. 
Now you want to do the same thing with the feet for your index poles. You don't want anything piled up against those either because those will rust out. Uh, and if you find that, that water pools in that area of the yard, then you might want to put in a French drain or dig a little trench or something that's going to move the water away from the pool. Great, great information. Um, why don't we transition to the what I call the equipment, but really it's probably more of the pumping and filtering equipment, including getting your electrical system in, in place, et cetera. You know, most pools, most above ground pools, smaller ones, especially that folks starting out with, come with a pump and filter. You know, is that sufficient? Is that something people need to be aware that it's probably going to be need to be replaced, et cetera? Uh, I would say it, it can depend on the pool, but generally it's well known that the equipment that comes with as combinations with those pools is generally undersized, um, especially the, the filters. Um, I know a lot of people, I got one of the bigger Intex pools, it's 26 feet in diameter. Um, so it came with one of their bigger pumps and the filter is a bit small. I have to backwash a lot more frequently than I see people on the forum typically do it with, you know, a more permanent uh, pool setup. Um, it it I, it does work. It, it's, I've had it up for over a year now. Um, it's just you know I have to backwash a bit more. I know if you get one of the smaller Intex pools, you can a lot of people will just get a bigger Intex filter and pump is one of the easiest upgrades for for that. No, um... Comment on uh, pumps and filters. Long that thing. You know, when I bought my pool like 11 years ago, I got on this website, found it through the grace of God, may I say, that uh, most of the pool packages, I didn't know anything about them. Most of the pool packages that are pre-put together and whatnot, all the pumps for them are oversized and the filters are undersized. Now, this is people in the industry that have been building pools like this for 50 years. And how you get to that point after that length of time. And as far as I know, they're still just about matched out like that. And I, I just don't understand it. I think one of the issues, kind of, and it's kind of throughout the pool industry in general, is that when something has become accepted practice way of doing things, they as a profession don't question it, even though it may be kind of obvious that you should question it, like the bigger pump, smaller filter thing. We know that if you've got a really big pump and you're pushing a lot of water through a little bitty filter, you're going to push a lot of dirt through it that would normally be caught in that filter if you use something sized better for that filter and for that pool. Because if you, the people that have variable speed, variable speed pumps, if you're running them low and slow all the time, they're going to catch a lot more dirt in their filters than if they were running at full blast 24-7. Now, question from me, um, here in July, pool pumps above one horsepower are going to have to be variable speed, any new ones sold or replacement motors sold. I wonder, I have not investigated, do, does anyone know if that's true for above ground pool pumps and motors? I haven't heard anything. Probably, I mean, asking one of the manufacturers if that's, yeah, well, a standard would be a good yeah. question. It's because that is, uh, I think that's going to be a shock to a lot of old pool owners that have, have been kind of, don't really mess with it. They just let their pool person handle their pool. And all of a sudden their motor goes out and they're going to be handed a bill for several thousand, a couple thousand dollars for a new pump that they used to replace with a $200 electric motor. Yeah. Well, it's definitely overkill on a smaller pool, although some of these above ground pools are bigger than what you see in ground pools. Yeah, and they have very small uh, variable speed pumps. I mean, that's something 0.85 horsepower all the way down to that level, which probably would be very, very good idea to have on a what you call a larger above ground pool. I mean, my in ground pool is only 6,000 gallons. So I mean, anything, anything much above 10,000 gallons could easily utilize a smaller VS pump. There's Maddie's kitty. Um, if, if Moss was here, he would tell you 
there are no two different same pumps built by any two manufacturers that are rated the same. There's also there's all almost like some kind of mystery that they don't want you to know, and you have to have a certain level of knowledge to be able to understand. But you know they're experts at. But just because it says it's a one horsepower pump does not mean that it's doing the same thing this other one horsepower pump is doing. So that takes a lot of research for if you're, if you're on the edge about that. So transitioning from the pumps and the filters, what about piping? You know, many of these above ground pools come with small, flexible hoses, et cetera. Is there a good reason to uh, change that or manage that? Well, if you're if you've got like actual hoses and the not not like the spa flex PVC, but hoses, they are going to uh, break down in the sun quicker than your hard PVC or your spa flex PVC will, and they're more likely to pop off if they you know they'll get um, heated up in the sun. That plastic will stretch, the connections will work loose. And you could come out one day and half your water is gone because your hose is popped off and you're pumping all your water out into the yard. Um, my pool had a that type of hose between the pump and the filter. And I came out one day and it had um, got the pinhole leak in it. And so it's like shooting 20 feet up in the air. And even though that's normal to have that type of connect connection on an above ground pool, I went ahead and put the spa flex hose on there to have a longer, more durable glued in connection that's not gonna pop off. Yeah, we're getting some chat here. Uh, replay, uh, Kelly popped in here, said replace those stupid flimsy hoses. <laughs> they will crack and you'll have a yard full of water. Quite, quite true. She also said back to my question on the pump, she's read that it doesn't apply to above ground pools. And I'm thinking that's possible too. Um, and another, another uh, Participant here, they had hard plumbed their Intex pool with PVC. So uh, I think the main thrust of that is the fact that the, those, as we called them, those flimsy hoses, beware of those. They can crack and break pretty quickly. Yes, I, my, one of my plans for this summer, and problem is I have too many plans, <laughs> not as much motivation and time, is to upgrade all my plumbing to PVC so that, uh, um, that's better. One thing that was mentioned, uh, as far as like the equipment upgrading and the plumbing, um, with an Intex pool, I think a lot of people don't realize that you can actually put through wall skimmers on them. And a lot of people on trouble free pool have done that, including myself. And, uh, that just makes a huge difference in, um, being able to cap to skim off the junk before it sinks to the bottom. And then it also gives you the opportunity to come with a vacuum plate so you can get a standard vacuum attachment, put it on a pole and vacuum your pool. I, I well, see. Just well, if you do question. hard plumb your pool, it's going to be much easier to upgrade your equipment. Go ahead, Woody. I say, I see that uh, Maddie just asked a question over there, she says, what size standalone sound filters should a medium size above ground pool 16 to 20 K gallons have? Uh, my pool is 13,500 gallons. It has a 250 pound sand filter for reference and it does a pretty good job. So anything up to in that range is at least 300 if it's a sand filter and I think you'd be in good shape. Yeah, what do you help me out? What is that like a 24 inch or something like that? You got a what? Is that a 24 inch diameter sand filter? It's like 22 inches, I think, is what mine is. Oh, so something in that range. That's yeah, I think yeah, I think if you go to like 24, that puts you in the 300 pound yeah. range. Yeah. I think we found in overall pools that that size range, that 22, 24 inch size range is about the smallest you ever really want to go. You go much smaller than that, it tends to just be a, a pain. I've seen sound filters that look like Sputnik landing. I can't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I went, oh my God, did that fall out of the sky or what? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, one of my buddies out in West Texas has an in-ground pool. He says, he says, I need that size and every bit of it because it stays full of red dirt out there. Yeah, yeah it's true. Um, the next step would be the electrical part. Uh, you know, many of these above ground pools come with a plug-in pump and everybody says, oh, I just plug it in. I don't have to worry about it. It's just plug it in. If I need an extension cord and my plug's 30 feet over here on my patio, I can just run my little extension cord I have for the house over there, right? So give us some background on some of the electrical and, and don't dwell on it, but also kind of bring into the discussion bonding a little bit. So, I've, I've dug into this a little bit. Um, I, being kind of a, a nerd, <laughs> um, I by no means am I an expert here. Um, so the first thing I always say is like, if you're doing anything electrical, I, I strongly recommend that you would get a permit for that, and that it'll get it will get inspected, and they'll make sure that you're doing everything safely. Um, so for my Intex pool, these are it's. I had some conversations with an inspector and they're classified as storable pools because they can be taken down every year. Um, and they have GFCIs on the plugs. They can just be plugged into a wall and set up. There's, there's, they are exempt from the bonding requirements that permanent pools have because they have some other safety features on them. Uh, but then talking to my inspector, he, uh, he said, if I were to upgrade that, Intex pump to something like a, you know, like a Hayward pump for a, a permanent pool, then I'd have to do bonding on the pool as if it were a permanent pool. Most of the above ground pool pumps will come with either a three foot or a six foot cord to plug it in. And what I did with one of my pumps was I took the six foot cord off and found an appropriate rated cord that was 20 foot long and attached that to my pump so I could run it farther to plug it in instead of having to have an electrician come out and put in a, a service. I would say in, in general, yeah, the use of extension cords is not, it's not a great practice. I, I actually, uh, I had an electrician come and install a GFCI outlet on a post closer to the pool. Of course, that is a, a bit expensive, so. Oh, mine, I have it, I uh, had the guys come out and uh, they added another 20 amp breaker in my uh, breaker panel box there, just run through conduit all the way up back to the back side of the house, probably about 30 foot long. And I've got a, a timer set up on it and everything else. And like you said, it's a GF, I see, uh, posts and a couple of plugs and it's it's done there's no there's nothing to worry about so i think the gist of it is is that electrical as we all say very very often even on the forum needs to be left to professionals and we do believe you know as much as possible or unless you feel you're extremely confident and just be careful and, and be cognizant of the issues around electricity. Now, as far as bonding goes, we know that storable pools and the pools with the GFCI plugs, uh, I believe, don't need to be technically bonded. But more permanent, hard-sided pools, I do believe, need to be bonded in most areas uh, by, by permit or, or just by good practice. Is that your all's uh, assumptions, too? Yes. That's my understanding. When they were just about through putting my uh, pool up and an inspector came out, he's, he's going, hey, we're, fi we're fixing to require this for code, so we're going to make you do this. And what they did was take a heavy-duty copper wire, run it all the way around my pool, attached it with a lug to every dadgum metal upright that I had or on the sides at least to uh where the little half A-frame leg came out. Went over there and drove uh, a metal rod in the ground, attached it to it, wrapped it around, and then run back up to the poop up to the hip to the uh grounding lug on it. That wasn't cheap. 
Now that technically is not bonding, but uh, because you have a ground rod involved, but <laughs> otherwise you're right. It's a number eight copper, solid copper wire that's run around and attached to the uprights and then uh, to the to the uh, bond lug on the on the pump motor and possibly a heater or saltwater chlorine generator or any other devices that you have. So uh, as Kelly just popped up here, she said she read the 2020 NEC guidelines and storable pores aren't even mentioned. And also, she thought brought up water bonding. That's something that's a little bit different on an above ground pool is, is that you typically need the water bond. Uh, most Gunite pools and in-ground pools, you don't have to water bond because you have other pertinences that are, are, are attached to or uh, in contact with the water that are metal. So well, let's move forward. You're talking about a corrosive anode, right, Marty? I'm sorry? Are you, you're talking about a, an anode that's... Yeah, well, not really an anode. You know, they use these plates, I think, in a skimmer um, that they run the bond wire to. So that the water itself is attached to the electrical equipotential around it, uh, you know, so that everything is equated. Equi equi How do I say this? Uh, uh, current equipotential, because that's the problem. Is if one has a different potential than another, and you're the and you're the the wire between it, you get the shock. And you know, when we see folks come on on the forum and say, oh, I get a tingle when I put my finger in and when I touch the water. That's not good, folks. Let's make sure everybody understands that from here on out. We, that's not good. Get, a, get professional assistance as quickly as possible and turn off all power to that pool because that can kill you. Um, maintenance, general maintenance. So several items that came up over the discussion and brainstorming. The first one that popped up uh, that I saw was out of level over time, what can be done if a pool starts to get out of level over time? It really depends on how badly it's out of level, <clears throat> whether or not you wanna take it down and redo it. Um, in my case, the my fence was fairly close to my pool and the neighbors had a big tree on right on the other side of the fence that they had taken down and as the root system rotted in the ground, that side of my pool started to drop a little bit. And it, it probably dropped about an inch and a half overall and stopped there. So I didn't take it down to redo it for that, but it was definitely something to keep an eye on. I, I don't have any experience with this, luckily. At the, at the moment. Uh, I, I have definitely seen on the forums though that um, hard wall pools that have gotten out of level over time and have ended up collapsing. You know, the walls buckle and they collapse. So it's definitely not something you want to ignore if your pool starts getting out of level very much. What do you all call out of level? Anything really for an inch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything over an inch. Okay. That's what I wanted to. If you can on. see it, just eyeballing it, it's out of level. It's probably too much out of level. As you all well know, we've had some new members post on the forum saying, oh, my pool's only about four or five inches out of level. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, go sit on that top rail on that side, would you? <laughs> That's not a good thing. Basically, laws of physics are going to take over at some point, and that pool is going to have one wall blow out or some sort of catastrophic failure. So basically, what I hear, if, if your pool begins to get out of level, and if it's more than one inch, you essentially are kind of put into the moment that you have to take it down and re-level. But there's very little that can be done with water in the pool. Is that a reasonable assumption? Yes, I would say so. Great. All right. So what about, and we already talked a little bit about it start to with, with Woody's uh, show and tell there, uh, rust of, rusting of metal parts. Uh, you all mentioned about doing all kinds of, you know, doing as much rust prevention as possible before. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where people have put in skimmers and those skimmers tend to be an area of rust. Um, 
you know, I would think that the rust would predicate be, be caused primarily due to uh, leaks in the liner. Is that a reasonable assumption? Usually, but not always. Okay. I'm, when my pool developed the rust problem, I didn't have any leaks in my liner. I didn't, the liner never did leak until the whole pool failed. But um, I think, especially in the hotter, humid areas, where you have a metal wall pool, you're going to have some condensation build up between your liner and your metal wall. And if it's not adequately rust proof, you're going to start getting little bubbles of rust there and seeing little trouble spots pop up. That's exactly what happened with mine. Yeah, I wonder if your local climate, you talked about condensation. I wonder if local climate drives a lot of this and maybe that's something we need to be make sure everybody's cognizant of. If you live in an area that is wet, that you get a lot of humidity, you get a lot of rain, your probability of issues are much greater like what he's showing us on, on the- Condensation, my friend. <laughs> so, but if you live in Tucson, let's say, or some other uh, relatively dry area like where I live, La Fla, Nevada, you know, um, probably rust is probably not going to be as big of an issue as long as you don't have a leak. I would think that would be reasonable. Yeah, that's, that's probably accurate. You know, that if you're in a low humidity area, you're probably not going to have as big an issue with rust normally. Right. Rust pops up everywhere over here. Yeah, Kelly is over here saying yes. Florida equals rust and wood rot, but not woody rot. But uh, <laughs> um, I have seen folks talk about dipping parts of like an Intex pool of the poles, uh, dipping them or something before they put them together. Jonathan, any comment on that? Did you read? Have you read anything along those lines, or did that, or anything? So I did not personally do this on my Intex pool. I have seen a lot of people, uh, yeah, maybe spray paint inside the poles. Um, it, I personally did not do any protection on inside. Originally the Intex pool uh, supports were just bare steel on inside. And so they'd rust out really fast. Um, one of their lines that they have in the last couple of years, their Ultra XTR series is coated on the inside. Um, as well as the outside. Um, and so I decided to not do that. And so I'm basically using it as an experiment to see how well they do. And I will definitely update uh, <laughs> the forum if it turns out that that is not sufficient. The experiment failed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I'm all, I've only had it up a little over a year now. So, um, but uh, yeah, as Kelly just mentioning there, if if you uh, if you scrape through any of that coating anywhere, be sure to to repaint that or recoat it with something to prevent rust. And I think that would apply to a steel hardwall pool too. If you needed to cut a hole in the metal wall for anything, or you it got cut, you'd want to recoat that as well. And <clears throat> any metal wall pool, like where you return or where the skimmer cuts are put. If you see any drips or leaks, you have to take care of them and not let them keep going. Because even, even small areas of rust can become a fatal problem for a pool. Um, something I remembered from earlier when we were talking about putting the um, posts on concrete blocks for support, something I see occasionally on the forum is people will get little four foot square patio pavers to use for their Intex pool. And they're, they're not big enough, they're not sturdy enough because as you're filling up your pool, those legs are gonna move and usually move out. So you wanna get something that's got enough space for those legs to move and not just slide right off your paver. And, um, and if they're not thick enough, they will crack under the weight of the pool over time. Great point, great point. Um, stepping to the next point would be liner and draining the draining in an above ground pool. Uh, what issues around one, if somebody needs to drain their pool, uh, issues around that, and then also about uh, issues with the liner or liner replacement, those just general maintenance items around liners and possibly draining. 
timing is important. Um, don't decide you're going to get a new liner and drain the pool and then it's four weeks until your liner comes in or you leave it sitting in your garage for two months before you get around to installing it because anytime that pool is empty, it's vulnerable to damage from wind, from rain, can wash out your face and your coves. So you wanna time it so that when you take that old liner out, it's you're ready to put the new liner in. Or if you're just draining to do repairs and you're gonna keep your liner you want to time it so that you're not leaving that pool empty and letting that liner dry out and possibly ruining it. You know, want to make sure you have enough time to get the work done and get the pool filled back up. Anything specific, Jonathan, on an Intex pool from a drainage? Do you take yours down at the at the end of the season? I, I do not, actually. The instruction manual tells you to. Um, and specifically points out that the warranty will be void if there's any damage from ice on the on the liner. Um, however, I saw a lot of people had success, so I left ours up over the winter here in Wisconsin, and it was it was a cold one, and everything was fine. I just had to drain it down, you know, below all the openings on it, and that was it. Yeah, one thing when we someone comes with a chemistry issue and says, well. We see their cyanuric acid level is 482 or whatever, and they need to drain the water off. Um, we always talk about how far down to allow it to drain. I, I always kind of on the conservative side, say on a hard sided pool or any, any of these above ground pools, I always say halfway. Is there a safe limit that you all can, can provide folks of how far down they can drain a pool safely? I wouldn't dare go below a foot. I mean, a, a one foot minimum left in that boat. You're just going to have to have some pressure against those walls. Yeah, the the Intex pools could, uh, in theory, be drained completely because they um, the instructions do say to drain it for the winter and completely disassemble the pool and bring it inside. Um, however, you would still have to be uh, very careful about what if you were to drain it completely you would have to be very aware of the forecast because if that pool is up and you got a thunderstorm rolled through or high winds it's you know you don't want an empty pool i think i've seen pictures on television like that something flying across the house or something like that maybe that was a jump house or something like that. <laughs> oh yes <Yeah, laughs> <laughs> Kelly mentioned in the comments that don't try to break up any ice in your pools because you can damage your liner. So make sure you get it drained to the appropriate point before winter. And, and just leave it be, right? Yep. And when, and when it's thawing, leave it be too. When the ice starts to thaw, if you go out there and try to chunk it up or thaw it or whatever, you have a probability of damage. And I think we've seen that in some cases too. Um, as far as... Uh, so while we're on it, winterizing, do you do anything chemically to winterize an above ground pool or do you just simply deal with it in the spring? Mine stays up all year round in, in Texas. You know, by the time that water gets uh, below 60, it starts using such a small amount of chlorine, it's, it's ridiculous, you know. I'm talking like a gallon or so a week, and, you know. I don't, I've gotten to the point where I just about know, know your pool is one of the things that we preach over time, what to expect. And I just know at this point that a gallon a week or so is going to take care of it. And I'm never open to it or, you know, the first day of spring go, oh my God, I let it get away. It, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, a poster here, a participant here chatted in and said, raised my free chlorine to slam level, covered it, and it was crystal clear when I opened it. Is that? Jonathan, is that pretty much what you did or do you not even bother covering it? So I did not bother slash get around to covering my <laughs> Intex pool. Uh, remember I was saying about uh, be sure to go there and, and drain it before you get the ice. And mine had ice starting to form before I, <laughs> I waited way too long. Um, but I, I did not actually cover mine with anything. Um, and then 
like I said, once it froze, it stayed froze all through the winter. That might not be the case everywhere. Um, but I did ha get a lot of leaves. I got a lot of trees near there that got in the pool over the winter time. It's kind of built up through the snow and all melted down. And so my pool started getting a little bit of green not long after the water thawed. Um, so I, the only thing I might do besides raise it up, you know, to slam, keep chlorine in there until it's frozen is I might try some of the uh, polyquat 60 that is recommended on the forum next for next year. Probably won't cover it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the group here is speaking, uh, you're the only one that has winter. The rest of us think we do. Um, and, and yours, as far as I'm concerned, yours starts Labor Day and doesn't end to Memorial Day. So that's a whole other discussion probably. But, uh, you know, if it's under 100 degrees, it's winter as far as I'm concerned. Um, one question that come up, and actually I think it was our, our esteemed admin, uh, Mr. Lee, asked, how often does a pool collapse? Well, we have one participant here that has history of that. So, <laughs> but in general, I don't think we hear that many, although sadly, two of our moderators have had their pools collapse, which seems kind of odd. But, uh, <laughs> so any, any comments on that? <laughs> Doing everything I can to bite my tongue, Marty, I swear. <laughs> Rust. It was rust. rust yeah. Miss then, um, I can't really speak for Kim, but um, I know she has said that they didn't have visible rust outside her pool. It was all inside. And they only saw it when they changed the liner. But um, <laughs> thanks, Maddie. Maddie. <laughs> um, we used to like Maddie. <laughs> No, but in my case, it, it, I had drained it to make repairs and then life got in the way and I didn't get it done. And then we had Harvey blow through, which actually filled my pool back up. We had so much rain and just that constant movement from heavy rains, you know, vibrates those walls. And when you have a weak point in metal, that metal fatigue, it's, it's going to rupture. And once it starts, it's like tearing a piece of paper. Um, and that's, you know, really all I can say about it. You just got to get on it when it happens and not put it off. Yeah, well, that's good. So in general, though, other than our two moderators, I have not heard too many people come on, on the forum and say that their pool collapsed. I, I don't, I, I honestly don't remember seeing that too often. But, uh, it's not a normal occurrence. Yeah. It's really not. Um, and most of the times when I have seen that it's happened, it has been due to structural issues like rust or somebody hit it with a lawn tractor and knocked a knocked something off the foundation or knocked a hole in it, and then it you know six months later it fell over or something. Yeah, probably also not something that somebody probably comes online and uh, on and says anything about. <laughs> Um, well, our last subject. The frost heave. I have seen problems caused by frost heave. Oh. Where um, it like pushed one of the uprights way up, or they had the cover guy wire go under the skimmer so that it pulled on it and bent the wall, and then eventually caused a failure or um, problems that way. So. I don't have any experience personally with frost heave. Um, <laughs> our frost line is about three feet near. Six feet down or something. <laughs> but, uh, frost line's in China somewhere, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's somewhere about 5,000 feet, so uh, above my head. I, uh, I think that would tie a little bit into. The frost heaving, at least, I think that would tie a little bit into if you notice your pool getting out of level over time, you would need to, to fix that. Yeah, you <laughs> see like some posts in concrete under there or something below the frost level. Yeah. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left. I got one more subject uh, and then we'll just kind of chatter or if we're done, we'll, we'll wrap up. But we've got about 10 minutes. Um, chemistry. Any real differences, anything specific of along the lines for an above ground pool? 
Water is water. It doesn't matter what you put it in. You still have to treat it the same way. It needs chlorine. It needs pH regulated. It, um, it, it, water needs what it needs if you want to keep it clean and sanitary. And the idea that you, it, it doesn't matter if you have like one of these little six inch deep inflatable waders. If you don't treat the water, then you should be changing it like regularly. But with our bigger pools where you can't really do that, you need to be putting the chemicals in there. And I have seen people like at pool stores saying, oh, it's only holds a thousand gallons. It doesn't matter. It, it matters. You don't want your kids getting sick. You don't want to get sick. You don't want to. It looks like a small. You know? I actually have a personal story on, on that. Uh, we had got, when I was a kid, my parents had gotten a, like, uh, one of those big plastic, I think they're like feeding troughs. It was, it was like two feet deep, like eight feet across. It was basically like a miniature pool. And at the time we were just like filling, filling they were just filling it up and us kids would swim in it for a little while and then they'd drain it every couple of days. And, and then uh, a, a few of my siblings got ear infections. Um, and uh, after that, my parents started using chlorine. <laughs> So it's very important to, to keep the water sanitary no matter what size the pool is. We use those little pools down here to what we call purging crawfish before we have a ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think the only difference with, with the pools is if you do have a small pool, like the really small Intex you know, pools that's only a, you know, a thousand gallons or a couple thousand gallons, and you do let the chemistry get way out of whack, it's gonna be a lot easier to just drain that, scrub it out and refill it rather than go through our slam process. Absolutely, and in fact, that's something that I think we, we as moderators and guides sometimes don't recognize is that people come on with a, a swamp and they've got a small pool, even a small above ground pool that, or a small in ground pool of 6,000 gallons or something, you know, if there's any way to exchange a large amount of that water through an exchange or siphon or whatever, they're much better off than fighting it with, you know, 30 gallons of chlorine. And uh, the cost of chlorine has gone up and, and et cetera. Um, I think none of you mentioned it, but I, I want to mention it, testing. Testing is important no matter what size pool. Now you can get away, as Zia said, with the small thousand gallon or up to 3000 gallon we say in our forum. Uh, pools with a very basic test equipment, but you know a six thousand plus gallon above ground pool needs a real test kit, right? Uh, Woody's got up and got his TF Pro there. Go big or go home. That's right. And yeah, uh, Woody, I, I, just, I just got mine the other day. Everybody's showing them off. Look at that. But uh, we'll have them back sometime to do their tests on on a video so we can show that sometime. The, the only uh, thing as far as uh. The, the chemical difference and the problems that could result for an above ground or at least a vinyl liner pool is I, I don't think that you would have anywhere near the, the scaling problems as you would on you know a plaster pool or some kind of things like that. That's the only thing that really comes to mind to me. It does pop up every once in a while that someone gets some scale on their vinyl liner uh, but not often with vinyl liners really it's uh, low pH is what you need to worry about because that'll cause your liner to pucker up and wrinkle and like mine did before I found TFP, you know, it can make it a real mess. Yeah, I think the one thing we do see with new, new members coming on whatever kind of pool, but especially vinyl pools or which all above ground pools essentially are, is as pool stores explain, though, you have to carry this large calcium hardness level. So here's uh, 50 pounds of cal uh, increaser for, you know, $382. And, and they come on and we say, you don't need any of that. I mean, you just don't need it, right? Now, if you have a heater, some heater manufacturers claim you need some calcium in your water. I, I question that because that's based on a steam boiler, which our heaters are not steam boilers. But that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, but that's that's something. But as far as uh, and what do you brought up scaling? So and we had a, a, a participant here put on. Oh, no, do do they need to bother about CSI? CSI is a very in depth uh, 
a discussion about chemistry. It's about the ability to, for calcium to either scale or, or calcium to be drawn out of plaster. Doesn't apply very much to liner pools at all. With a saltwater chlorine generator, it does apply on the, you don't want it to be a positive number just so that you don't get buildup on your plates of your, of your uh, saltwater chlorine generator. But otherwise being under zero is, is not of significance. Um, here's a good one. And boy, we can have some discussions about this salt water. And we've got a few minutes left here. Salt water, you know, they'll buy a, folks buy an above ground pool and, and say, well, salt, no salt water. water, no salt water. No salt, that's right. And the, and the manufacturers say salt water avoids the warranty. Salt water is this or that bad. Well, as we all know, we need to voice out here that if you put chlorine in a pool, you have salt water. Yeah. Now, is it? The, no, the, I mean, when I say no salt water, what I'm saying is the condition that that, uh, that there is <laughs> strictly chlorine. All it's ever had is liquid chlorine poured in it. And I, I still got that in Texas humidity and what a rain sitting. I don't know. It's, it's just bum with me. Right. As I always say, many folks with above ground pools typically live in the South, excluding Jonathan and some others, but many of them are in the South, be it Florida or South Texas. And quite frankly, they are living in a swamp. So, I mean, if you live in a swamp, metal doesn't last long. Uh, just we need to remember that. Um, so go ahead. Anybody else have anything on that? Um, my pool also did not have additional salt added to it. And it had its lovely fatal rust problem. And um, yeah, it's water is aggressive without salt. I mean, you're going to have issues wherever you have moisture and heat. Um, if you have a, like a concrete garage and water runs off your roof, you're going to notice you have a line where that roof line is in your concrete where it's eaten away some of that. Um, cement and you have more exposed pebbles than you would anywhere else on your driveway. Right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just the aggressive nature of water in general. You're going to have problems if you don't monitor things and salt is just kind of been a scapegoat for it. And I, it's not a salt issue. I, I don't have a salt water chlorine generator on my pool. Um, if I ever get around upgrading my equipment, uh, that it would definitely will be adding one um, because I do have one, a small one on my hot tub and uh, it's, it's amazing. I don't have to go out there and add chlorine, you know, every day, every other day, it just maintains it. And I just add chlorine after we take a soak to take care of our bather waste. So definitely if I upgrade to non intex equipment on my pool, I'm going to be adding a saltwater chlorine generator on there. So our last subject, and we're wrapping this up perfectly, um, adding liquid chlorine or chemicals to an above ground pool. Anything, you know, with, within ground, we say over the return, pencil size stream for liquids, et cetera, et cetera. Anything special on an above ground pool? Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> you're less likely to splash bleach on your pants if you have an above ground pool, if you're adding it in front of the return. It takes some real effort to do that with an above ground pool. Yeah. Do you all brush the pool at all after you add anything? Is that something that you think is necessary or is it probably just not all that necessary? You know, uh, muriatic acid, many people just, just cringe and, 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 and run, on, run away with their hair on fire when they hear muriatic acid or the pool store told them that it's going to immediately destroy and melt their, melt their liner. Um, any issues? I mean, some of you, I'm, I'm sure, use the muriatic acid. Well, in, in an above ground pool the size of ours, mostly I would think. I mean, if my pH is uh, 8.0 out there right now, I can go out there and play and think about it. I pour, you know, maximum 16 ounces is all it's going to take. And I'm right back in sweetness range there. So we're not talking about I've got to go out and add a gallon or a gallon and a half like you know, most larger in-ground pools. So I think that takes care of a lot of that right there. I did not have to add acid very often. And when I did, I just poured it in front of the return and let it go. I didn't brush it or anything extra. 
Yeah, I I just add it in front of the return and as well. I don't brush it. So fantastic. Well, anything else anybody wants to bring up? We're right at our time our time commitment. And I uh, any any other uh, big items? Um, I'm not seeing it. Kelly's been pouring off some chat here, but nothing. I I think we've pretty much covered most of it. You know, I appreciate her using chat to, to guide us on some things occasionally, since she was too shy to come on the video. Um, anything else anybody has? You get paid more as a guy if you go on video, I hear. Yeah, that's the pay is pay is all. It's 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 so much more. <laughs> twice, twice as much, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll have to go through that sometime. But uh, I thank you all for joining me and uh, providing your insight and your expertise on above ground pools. Um, I think this will be well well watched on our TFP TV and, and I appreciate it. So I'm going to stop the recording at this time. And uh, again, thank you all. If you listen closely, you can hear my poo coming.